Hello, welcome to EMN5. My name is TJ Welniak. This week we're going to talk about necrotizing fasciitis. Necrotizing fasciitis is a very scary disease and not very common, but you probably will see it at some point in your career. And what it is is a deep soft tissue infection that is very rapidly progressive and can make your patients very sick within a matter of hours. And one of the reasons why we're talking about it today is that it can be very difficult to diagnose. Early on, it really does look like a number of conditions that are usually very benign. In between the subcutaneous tissue and the muscle is this fibrous tissue called the fascia. And in between the fascia and the muscle is what we call a potential space. To get a better understanding of what a potential space is, think of it in terms of two pieces of paper stacked on top of one another. Now, there's no actual space in between the pieces of paper, but there could be. If you were to slip your hand in between those two pieces of paper, there would easily be a space that you would create. In the same way, infection is able to move along the fascial space with little resistance. Another reason why this is so dangerous is that the fascia itself does not have a great blood supply. It doesn't have very many blood vessels going directly to it. Thus, our normal immunologic response can't get to the area as well. Infection tends to compound this problem by not only obliterating and thrombosing the few little capillaries that do supply the fascia, but also changing the oxygen concentration of the area such that other forms of bacteria might be able to thrive. This makes for an overall dire situation as neither your immune system nor antibiotics are able to get to the tissue that is infected, which because of its location has an open highway to spread and get worse. There are two types of necrotizing fasciitis. Type 1 is generally polymicrobial. A lot of different organisms that are involved here and you usually see these at the extremes of age. Elderly individuals, neonates. The most common cause in neonates is omphalitis, infection from the umbilical stem. With older folks, there's usually some combination of comorbidity, whether it be peripheral vascular disease, diabetes, immunosuppression, renal disease, chronic alcohol use, even chronic infection, chronic cellulitis of any part of the body can potentially develop into this. Type 2 is usually caused by one organism, most commonly group A streptococcus. And the scary thing about this is that it can infect anyone, any age, any comorbidities. Early signs of necrotizing fasciitis, I want you to remember the poop poem. So pain out of proportion to exam, and then pain outside the erythematous margin. You should also be suspecting this in patients who present with sepsis without a clear source, especially your bedridden patients, the patients who may have underlying dementia or altered mental status, or really can't tell you what's going on, but you have a high suspicion for sepsis. Make sure you take a look at their entire body, take a look at any lesions or redness or skin findings that might tip you off. In a late presentation, the skin does start to have some changes. It may be more of a violation color, a bruising type of color. You may see them start to develop some bullae, blisters. They start as clear and late those start to turn hemorrhagic from a dark purple brown. Another late finding is crepitus, so free air in the soft tissue. If you press on that tissue, it will sound and feel like bubble wrap or rice krispies and it's pretty impressive when it is present. Patients at this stage may also complain of some anesthesia to the area due to infarction of the underlying superficial nerves that are supplying that skin. So let's review our key modalities of imaging noting that x-ray radiography does okay for subcutaneous gas but really it's poorly sensitive for everything else. CT scan in the middle here way better for most gas and fluid collections it still misses a lot of early forms of this disease. Traditionally MRI is touted as the imaging of choice for soft tissue, but there has been some evidence suggesting that it's actually less specific for necrotizing fasciitis, meaning that it may actually overcall necrotizing fasciitis when there's not actually necrotizing fasciitis. Another problem with MRI is that it often takes way too long to get, and when you have an infection that is potentially spreading at a rate of one centimeter an hour, time isn't necessarily on your side. Well, it needs to be validated a little bit more. Bedside ultrasound has been gaining a lot of steam lately for its role in diagnosing necrotizing fasciitis using the staff exam, STAFF, so subcutaneous thickening, air, and the presence of free fluid along the fascia. This is in contrast to the cobblestoning that you would see with cellulitis, which may or may not be present as well. In regards to lab work, sometimes you'll hear talk about a larynx score, a score developed to try and distinguish necrotizing infection from other infections that utilizes white blood cell count, sodium, among other lab findings. But this is not generally thought of as very sensitive, and you're going to miss a lot of patients if you rely on this for your diagnosis. As shown in the case report here, where a patient had a larynx score of zero and actually had necrotizing fasciitis, as well as this and other reviews that have looked retrospectively at patients with this diagnosis and found a fair number presenting with a number lower than the cutoff suggested by the original authors. Once you suspect this diagnosis, you should be doing two things. You should
should be starting antibiotics, covering gram positives, gram negatives, anaerobes, knowing that it's not going to stop the spread of neck fash, but may help you in regards to bacteremia or sepsis that may be going on as well. And then you also need to consult surgery. As we mentioned, normal lab work, normal imaging does not rule out this diagnosis, of which the only gold standard for diagnosis is direct visualization in the operating room. So it's going to be up to your clinical suspicion to recognize this and get the patient the help they need. And that concludes our talk. Here's a list of additional sources. Thanks for watching. Again, this is TJ Wolniak from EMN5. See you next week.